God, that every one of us would hear what you're saying to us today and take a step closer, go a step further, uh, whatever you want us to do, God, in our relationship with you, on our, in our faith in you, in our journey with you. We love you and thank you for a day that we can celebrate the resurrection that Jesus is alive. We love you and thank you. In his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Awesome. Now you can have a seat. Man. Oh, man. Did you guys... Uh, so, Ashley, where's Ashley? Man, I, I'm... Ashley McDonald, I'm sorry for uh, kind of waving at you and going, oh, you yeah, know, because she said something about guests, take your card out to the gazebo. You go out to... You can't even see the gazebo, man. If you go out to the gazebo, it's covered with a tomb scene, okay? So I was going to say you could go into the tomb, but we're trying to keep people out of there, okay? So uh, it's, uh, we had, that was for our sunrise service this morning, which by the way was phenomenal, okay? So, uh, all right. How many of you were here at the sunrise service? All right, okay. I told you I was going to take a count, all right? So I want to see who the real spiritual people are in the room, okay? Sunrise at two services in one day kind of brings back memories, doesn't it? All right, so uh, awesome, and and um, uh, we it was just awesome out there. So so uh, Steve Scott and the crew of guys came out yesterday and built this big set out there. If you haven't seen it yet, you're gonna have to walk outside onto the patio and see that. But uh, you know, I told Steve, I said, "Come on, dude! Like you built this big world that almost covered the cross. Can you do something better than that?" And so it's, it's pretty awesome. But we were really nervous. I was nervous because we, we set that thing up. And I'm, I'm just, you know, I said we like I actually helped, right? But, but I, we got it. When it was all done, <laughs> I said, man, we, I, I'm just kind of nervous about somebody like getting into the tomb during the night because, you know, around here we'll have people that, you know, wake up on campus. And so uh, I was like, you know. <laughs> Uh, what are we going to do? I, I thought for a second, man, maybe we're going to have to hire some Roman soldiers to keep people out. Not keep someone in, but keep people out. And, uh, you know, I don't know. So uh, we had a, a couple of people actually uh, came by last night and checked out the tomb. And this morning, Jonathan McDonald was like, uh, hey, why is there a pillow in here? So I don't know. I don't know. So anyway, uh, so if you're a guest today, if you're a guest today, we have a shirt for you. If you're, if you're a first-time guest, raise your hand. Okay? Awesome, awesome. All right, if you're not a first-time guest, but you want to be, raise your hand. Okay, because you know I'm getting ready to say, all right. So if you're a first-time guest today, you go out not to the gazebo, which is the tomb today, but you go across to one of the tents over there. We've got a team of people that will meet you out there. Take that welcome card out there. And we got a t-shirt for you. This is free to you today for being here. This says, God's got this. That's kind of our theme for the year. Pro 356 is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So God's got this. And is there a better way to say God's got this than an empty tomb? Come on. Is there a better way to say God's got this than an empty tomb? All right. Okay. So make sure and grab your shirt. And those of you that aren't first-time guests, you can have one too. Okay. You can just go out there. You can have one too. It's ten bucks. All right. All right. So let's let's get this going today. All right. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, Easter, and we we say here Easter changes everything. Easter did change everything, right? And so today we want to we want to let this change us. Okay. I don't know where you're at spiritually. I don't know where you're at or, or in your journey with with God and with Jesus and all that. But we're going to talk today about Jesus is alive. We're, Jesus is alive. We, we celebrate that. So if you have a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you know where those are, you can, you can kind of work that. If the person next to you has a, a cell phone or something where they can kind of get, they got the app, you know, use that. That's, that's cool too. As a matter of fact, if you pull out and you are on your Bible, Check in at Calvary today and say, hey, I'm at the service, so you're, you know, your mom and dad will know that you came to church today. <clears throat> Which, by the way, my mom's here today. Yeah. So, a lot of mom jokes coming up in this sermon I wasn't even thinking about. So, uh, anyway. All right. So, uh, here we go. A few years ago, someone said that the world had Bob Hope, Johnny Cash, and Steve Jobs. And now we have no jobs no cash, and no hope. Today's the day 
we say there's hope, right? Today's the day, Resurrection Day, because of our hope, Jesus. And it's not, I hope, but it's, I have the hope in Christ, right? So today's the day we say we have hope because Jesus is alive. And he gives us life, real life, in him today. So Romans 10, 9 says, we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, all right? Jesus is alive. There's a uh, pastor up in Northern California named John Ortberg. He, he is the pastor of Menlo Park uh, Presbyterian Church. I think they just changed their name, but that's, that's kind of the name. Okay, so John Ortberg, one of my favorite speakers, authors. Um, he has a book called Who Is This Man? It's about the life of Jesus and how he's changed the unprecedented change that Jesus has brought to our world and the influence that he's had. And uh, uh, in, in John, Pastor John's style and, and kind of this witty humor, I, I love the way he writes and the way he talks. He says this about Jesus. He says, it is in Jesus' name that desperate people pray, that grateful people worship, and that angry people swear. From christenings to weddings to sick rooms to funerals, it's in Jesus' name that people are hatched, matched, patched, and dispatched. I'm like, that, that could preach, right? Yeah, so anyways, I mean, I, I love that. Yet, there's still, there's still an, uh, kind of a, a level of unbelief and skepticism. And I think our world is so much more skeptical now about everything, right? Like what is true and who's true and what are their motives and what's the agenda and all that stuff. And, and, and so we, we live in a world that there's a, there's a sense of skepticism and unbelief about what really happened on the day that Jesus rose from the grave. I mean, what really happened? I mean, did he really rise from the grave? Matter of fact, in an article in Time magazine, actually in the 90s, and I have a part of it in your notes there, I believe, a guy named uh, John Dominic Crossan, who was a leader of this group called the Jesus Seminar, said after the crucifixion of Jesus, his corpse was probably buried in a shallow grave, barely covered with dirt, and subsequently eaten by wild dogs. The entombment of Jesus and the resurrection was the result of wishful thinking. Now this is from a group called the Jesus Seminar. So it goes downhill from there, right? But I mean... So on the other hand, on the other hand, true believers in Jesus Christ today say and believe things like this. The Gospels do not explain the resurrection. The resurrection explains the Gospels. Belief in the resurrection is not an appendage to the Christian faith. It is the Christian faith. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. And before you say, yeah, I agree with that, okay? Because you're going to think about me. But, uh, you know, all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. So if, if, if Jesus did not rise from the grave, and we're going to talk about that, what I'm saying today and what you're hearing today and what you're claiming today and this faith that you say that you have is completely meaningless. As one author I've read uh, currently uh, says, it's kind of like that chocolate Easter bunny that you might get every year, and every year you bite into it thinking it's going to be solid chocolate, right? Like you bite into that thing, like, man, this thing, this year, I'm hoping that thing's solid chocolate. And you bite into that, and it's hollow on the inside, right? If Jesus did not rise today, our faith is like that. It may look good on the outside, but absolutely hollow on the inside. I like what John Stott says, Christianity is in its very essence a resurrection religion. The concept of the resurrection lies at its heart. If you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. <clears throat> so let me ask you a question. Do you believe Jesus is alive today? Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus is alive today? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Some of you are like enthusiastic. Some of you are like, man, I wish I was in that choir with those kids, man. Like you were, you were thinking, I, I could do that, right? Some of you adults, I could do that, right? 
I can do that. Some of you think, man, I could moonwalk across. I mean, I could do that because I'm enthusiastic about my faith. You know, Jesus is alive, and, and I believe that, and yes, you know, all that, and I, and I agree with that too. But you might be here today and say, yeah, I believe Jesus is alive. A little more, a little less enthusiastic about it. And in your mind, you might be asking, I'm not really sure how to really connect with that. Or maybe you hear someone, someone's here today saying, well, I don't really believe in all of that, or I'm trying to figure that out. And I can buy the fact that Jesus was a great teacher. There was actually a person named Jesus. He was from Nazareth, and he was a great teacher. He had a big following, and then he died a, kind of a cruel death, and he was a martyr for what he believed. But I just can't really believe all that Jesus is alive stuff. And I want to talk to all of those people today. And I want to tell you why Christians have historically done more than just claim that Jesus is alive. They have and still do put their entire faith, their enti the entire weight of their faith on the facts of the resurrection. So let me tell you today how I know that Jesus is alive. And here's where Acts chapter 1 comes in. How do I know Jesus is alive? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you what I call my top five proofs that Jesus is alive. We're going to start in Acts chapter 1. It says in my first book, the, which is the Gospel of Luke, the writer of Acts is the same writer that wrote the Gospel of Luke. And this is his second volume. So he's, he's doing this, you know, life of, of Jesus and the church. And he says, in my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them. He proved to them. If you have a Bible, you've got something to circle that word. He proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. So as we look at that, that particular passage in, in Acts, Luke, the physician, is saying, I've written down many things to prove to you, and I've, I've, I've studied the proofs for you of how I know that Jesus is alive. The word proved here, in, in I think in the uh, King James Version, says many infallible proofs. It's actually from an original Greek word that means demonstrated decisive evidence. You see, Jesus' resurrection was no sleight-of-hand illusion or some story fabricated by a bunch of faithful followers of some religious leader of the day. No, this was backed by solid, visible, undeniable, infallible proofs that he was alive. As one man says, the early Christians didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus because they couldn't find his dead body. Not why they believed, because they couldn't find the body. They believed because they did find a living Christ. So we were talking about the, at the sunrise uh, service this morning, the rock, the rock wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. The rock was rolled away so that we could get in and see that the tomb's empty, all right? So, so today, I, wa I, I just wanted us to say, man, we believe Jesus is alive, and you're somewhere on that track with what you believe about that. But here's my top five. Why I believe that Jesus is alive. Proof number one, proof number one, fulfilled prophecies. Fulfilled prophecies. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you flip over there, the Apostle Paul writes the greatest chapter in the Bible, I believe, on the, 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 the resurrection. Kind of the whole, the whole package deal there. But he says, I passed on to you what was most important... And what has also been passed on to me, Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. According to the scriptures, right? He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said, or according to the scriptures. So according to the Old Testament, what happens here in the New Testament fulfills that, okay? So according, Paul is saying, I, I preach to you and I'm passing on to you what I was given about Christ in my own life, that he uh, died, was buried, 
and was resurrected on the third day. That's the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So, so fulfilled prophecy. Like Isaiah 53, talking about the death or the crucifixion of Christ, says, yet it was our weakness that he carried. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Isaiah 53 is such a great Old Testament passage written hundreds of years before the crucifixion. And you can compare the life of Jesus and the cross and the crucifixion and see that's, that's the picture right there. That's the fulfillment. We can see in Psalm 16, the, the writer of this psalm in, in a, a prophecy about the coming Messiah said, For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. These are fulfilled prophecies about the coming Messiah. <clears throat> so when you think about the proof, just this one proof of fulfilled prophecy, the precise lineage, the place, the time, the manner of birth, people's reactions, the betrayal, the manner of death, and all the surrounding circumstances went, that went with it are just a fraction of the hundreds of detailed prophecies in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in Jesus and pinpoints him as Son of God, Messiah, Savior of the world. If you're like, well, I'd like to check that out. I would encourage you to uh, get a book by the name of uh, Josh McDowell called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Lee Strobel has also written a couple books. And the, the, one of them is called The Case for Christ. The Case for Faith is another one. Great, great evidences in there, proofs, and talking about these prophecies fulfilled in Jesus. So proof number one, how do I know that Jesus is alive? Number one, proof, fulfilled prophecy. Number two, empty tomb. Empty tomb. You knew that was coming, right? Empty tomb. So uh, we, we talked about this this morning at the sunrise service, but Luke 24 says the women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the angels or the men asked, the, these angels there, asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. <clears throat> so that first morning, the tomb was empty of Jesus, right? And, and then... Those angels are in there, but they're gone, okay? So, so the tomb is empty. And the tomb is still empty, by the way, right? The tomb is still empty. So when you think about this, I, I, I want to give you a couple of that. Well, how do we know that? Like, like, what are the proofs of that? Like, how do we know that someone didn't come by and steal the body? Well, that's why they had the Roman soldiers there, and it was sealed, and there was all kinds of things about that. No one came to steal the body. If they did come and steal the body... They wouldn't have left the linen cloth. They would have taken the whole thing, right? They wouldn't have thought, oh, we better leave these here to make it look like he just came out of the, right? But anyways, here, here's, here's something you may not have thought about. Who discovered the tomb first? Who discovered the tomb first? The empty tomb. Like, who went there first? Women. Women. Hey, right? Hey. Like, what? Women. <laughs> now, today, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for saying that. But back then, it was like the women went first. Now, back in this day, women, there, there was no, I mean, there's no rights. They weren't, their voice wasn't listened to. They were not good witnesses. That's just how it was. That's, that's not the true, the truth of it. It's just the way the culture was, Right? So, so for the fact that in the Gospels it shows all of them that the women went first would be an embarrassment to the apostles, would be an embarrassment to the early church. And if they were writing it, making it up, they would not have included that. They would have said, oh, yeah, but they went because we told them. Typical guys, right? <clears throat> they didn't make it up. Then it was investigated by Peter and John. Then Peter and John, they run there, and 
and they see that the women's story checked out because women weren't good, actually, factual witnesses at the time. So they had to go check it out, and guess what they found? Nothing. The tomb was empty, that's what they found. Then they proclaimed this throughout Jerusalem. They didn't, it's not like they left the town and went and preached Jesus is alive far away. They were in Jerusalem, where he was beaten, where he was crucified, where he was buried, all of that. He's alive. Now, if he, was, if he wasn't alive, somebody would have produced the body, right? I mean, the religious leaders themselves would have produced the body. But why didn't they? Because he's alive. He's not dead. Proclaimed, they, they preached throughout that. And then one other thing. Um, the, the actual burial site was never really venerated as a, or shri- as an, uh, enshrined for this special prophet. Which is something that they would do for a very special prophet. They didn't do that. Why? Because he's not there. It wasn't really his, his tomb in that sense. It was just a place to to come alive in a minute, right? So, so the empty, you go there, the tomb is still empty. Because Jesus is alive. So that's a, that's a really tough part to try to prove against the resurrection because there's an empty tomb that you got to deal with. Proof number three, faith-filled followers. Faith-filled followers. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 15 to say he was seen by Peter, and then by the 12 after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. 500 of his followers, most of whom are still alive during the writing of this, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and then later by the apostles. Here we have this proof, this is one of the great, great proofs of a living Savior, <clears throat> is that these Fearful followers were transformed into faith-filled followers of Jesus Christ. They had been disillusioned and broken up and a, a band of doubters, and they were, they were fearful, and they became fearless and courageous. They became this pack of preachers that were talking about this person as if he was actually alive. Why? Because he was. They had seen him die, and they ran came and they met Jesus and they tur- he turned them in to that fearless group of followers, faith-filled followers that actually died for their faith. I think that if it wasn't true, if they were making it up, that someone would have cracked. I know Peter would have, right? <laughs> but they turned into just these faith-filled followers As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, Peter and John are brought before this religious high council, and they're told, quit preaching about Jesus. You're filling the whole world with this this doctrine about this Messiah, Jesus, who's alive. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men who had no special training. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Jesus. Now, I don't think that means, yeah, they were his followers. They had been with Jesus. I think that meant they'd have to been with Jesus after the resurrection. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, they saw him alive. It wasn't like, well, we were followers, yes, and we saw him die. But no, they had seen him alive. They had been, they recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. I think we need more of that today, don't you? I think we need a lot more of that today, don't you? I think we need a lot more people, especially today, because today, Easter Sunday, we're going to have a lot of people at the end of the day, they're going to have checked off, went to church. We were kidding about this morning about the, uh, the sunrise service. A lot of people came to the sunrise service because then you got the rest of the day, right? Check. Today will be a day that at the end of the day a lot of people will have been to church. The life changer is have you been with Jesus? The life changer is have you seen Jesus? The life changer is do you know 
Jesus. So faith-filled followers. Number four, proof number four, saved skeptics. The Apostle Paul goes on to say, last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him, for I'm the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. He was one of these religious leaders. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, he was one of these religious leaders who was fighting against what Jesus was doing. He was fighting against those who were proclaiming Jesus is alive. He was fighting against this early church. He was trying to wrap that up. He was, he was going in and persecuting, uh, helping imprison and, and, and kill those early Christians. He was persecuting the church. And on the way to one of those events, on the road to Damascus, he's going along and he is knocked off his horse. And the person that speaks to him is Jesus. You see, Paul saw Jesus alive. And that changed him. You see, when we see Jesus, that's what changes our life. He is risen. So the Apostle Paul became just an amazing, powerful preacher of the gospel because he had seen Jesus, even as a, as a skeptic, now saved the disciple Thomas, doubting Thomas, we call him. Thomas kind of gets a bad rap most of the time. But in John chapter 20, they told him, we have seen the Lord, but he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Really? Really? So Jesus, Jesus shows up eight days later because Thomas missed that first upper room scene, and then he missed the second one, and then he was in the third one. And he said, eh, unless I see this guy, unless I see Jesus, and then this guy, here's a guy who'd been with him for three and a half years, right? He had heard everything. He'd seen everything. So he, he's with him. And uh, he says, unless I see Jesus and I see the nail prints in his hand and I touch the wound in his side, I'm not going to believe. So Jesus shows up and says, well, here they are. You want to touch them? No! <laughs> right? You think when, 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 Jesus, when Thomas saw Jesus, he's like, well, wait a minute. Let me touch and make sure you're real. Because you just walked through that door. And I mean, through the door. So I want to make sure that my hand won't go through you. But no, he saw Jesus, and he's like, my Lord and my God. That's what you're going to do. That's what I'm going to do. When we see Jesus, we're not going to go up to him and say, okay, wait a minute. I've been, ask I've been dying to ask you this question. You know, let me tell you what I'm really ticked off about. Yeah, I get it. You blessed my life, but I got this one question. I I I'm going to get up in your grill right now, because this is the one thing that I've been wanting to find out. I want to know why. No, you're not going to do that. You're going to do exactly what Thomas did. You're going to fall before him, and you're going to say, my Lord and my God. Now, you're either going to say that, according to the Scripture, because you've seen Jesus, or because you've rejected Jesus, and it all becomes clear that he is Lord and God. Every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Every knee will bow every tongue confess. Saved skeptics. Lee Strobel, who I talked about earlier, he was an investigative reporter in Chicago. And Lee's wife had become a Christian uh, going through a ministry called uh, a, a big church in Chicago. The um, name of the church just flew out of my head. Okay, Willow Creek, all right? So anyways, uh, his wife had become a Christian and Lee's this, like this, very skeptical, um, uh, agnostic um, reporter. And he finds out his wife has become a Christian. He's like, all right, this is it, man. This is it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in. I'm going to investigate this thing. And I'm going to prove that Christianity is a hoax. So he got all his information, got all, did all this study. And through all of that, you know what he did? He became a follower of Jesus Christ. Because there was way more evidence for believing in Jesus than whatever he was believing in or didn't believe in. Okay? So if you're, if you're skeptical, it means maybe that you don't have enough evidence. Well, if you really check the evidence, then you're going to find Jesus is Lord, all right? Jesus is alive. 
So proof number five. Proof number five. So four was save skeptics. Proof number five. This is my favorite one. Personal experience. You say, oh, Pastor Ken, that's not fair. Personal experience. That's not going to prove anything. I'll tell you something. It's not going to prove anything to you, but it's really important to me. You see, John 20, again, Jesus said this with Thomas. He said, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Have any of you seen Jesus? But you believe, right? Okay, when I say I've seen Jesus, I'm going to tell you what that means to me. But none of us were there that day. None of us were there that first century. None of us had seen Jesus come out of that tomb. And yet we believe. Why? Because the way he works in our life. It's a great proof, the empty tomb for the resurrection, personal experience. See, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior back in 1978. Man, whew, that's a long time ago. 1978. You weren't born yet, Justin? You were eight? Wow. You were probably a good kid back then, so... Uh, Nineteen seventy-eight. <laughs> I'm just kind of picturing this eight-year-old with tattoos. I'm like, wow. That's <laughs> L.A. on the back, you know, whatever. Okay. <laughs> Was the Venice in different style of writing? I don't know. So, uh, anyway, I'm sorry, sort of. Anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> All right. So I accepted Christ. So Al Coleman's sitting right here. His son, Tim. Steve is another son. So Steve's brother, Al's son, Tim, came to my house a couple blocks away, knocked on the door, and said to me, do you believe if you died today, you'd go to heaven? And my answer was, I hope so. I hope so. That was my hope. I hope so. And you know what I was hoping? I was hoping that my goodness was better than my badness. Right? I was hoping that the scale in the sky, you know, that's not there according to the Bible, but, you know, that scale in the sky that says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm good. You know, I'm, 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 I'm good. And, and I talked to a guy just, you know, a couple years ago, and he was like, man, I just believe that as long as you're good, as long as you're good and you believe in God, that you're good. That's, that's good. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, how good do you have to be? You just got to be good. So how good? What's the standard of goodness? I said, do I have to be as good as Mother Teresa? Or can I just be as good as you? And how bad do I have to not be? Do I have to not be as bad as Charles Manson? Or just do I not have to be as bad as Steve Scott? I mean, there's a, you know... It's like, I think I could do that, all right? But it's, that, that's not it. So he came and he said, how, and I said, I hope so. He said, how about if I come and I show you some scriptures to show you that you can know, not hope, but know that you're on your way to heaven. So he came in that day. I knelt down in the front room of my house, just right over here on the corner of Santa Ana and Nichols. And had never really prayed like this. But I prayed and I said, Jesus, forgive me for my sin. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. And I got up from that prayer, and Tim said, Do you believe Jesus saved you today? I said, Yes. He said, Are you sure? And I said, Yes. He said, Really? I said, Yes. He made me say that three times. And then he said, All right, I'll see you in church on Sunday. I was like, Whoa, 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 wait. I had no idea what that would mean for my life. I had no idea. See, I had, I had a, a, a plan, kind of what, what I was thinking my life was, where my life was, was going to go. And I, I can tell you right now, it was not right here. Alan said last week he wasn't the guy. Man, I wasn't the guy either. I don't want to be the guy, okay? I don't want, it's just like, man, no. 
God changed my life. And in and, and Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's, that's my life verse, right? So, so I got saved. And Jesus changed my life. And now as a pastor, I get the front row seat in seeing life change happen on a continual basis. You see, I I get to see people be healed of sickness, be healed of hurts and habits and hang-ups. I get to see people, I get to see Jesus restoring relationships in marriages and in families. I get to see Jesus bring parents and children back together, which is a direct correlation to Malachi where it says when the Messiah comes, the hearts of the parents will be turned to their children and the hearts of the children will be turned to their parents. I get to see that. I get to see Jesus in that. I get to see a a, a Jesus that is alive and well and blessing my life when I get to hold one of my new granddaughters. Of course, when they're not crying, okay? When they start crying, I'm like, hey, someone with more expertise in these areas needs to do something here. But I get to see that. When I, get, when I hear one of the greatest sounds on the planet, children laughing. Is there a better sound? I mean, that's just awesome, right? So, so I, I always tickle my, my, I always tickle my kids, tickle my grandkids. And, and, and one of my grandkids, uh, Bradley, one of his, when Brian and Ashley and the boys were staying with us, I was tickling them one night. And um, Bradley used to say, tickle my brothers, right? Tickle my brothers. So I was tickling him, you know, and then and Caleb says, tickle my mom. It's like, no, nah, that's not going to happen, okay? <laughs> it was just that, that weird moment where me and Ashley were like, no, no, okay, yeah, no. Ooh, right? Not because of Ashley, okay? <laughs> yeah, I love my daughter-in-law, all right? So uh, she's not going to tickle her, all right? So uh, Anyways, I, I, the, the sound of kids laughing, right? I, I, love, I, I love to be in the front row, and I, I see these as holy moments for me is when I get to be in the front row. It's not that I like to be there. It's just that I get to be there. It's a privilege for me and an honor to be in the front row of a, of a believer in Christ who's getting ready for surgery, and I get to pray with them and, and, and bring the comfort of God um, I get to see that. I get to see Jesus in their face as he ministers to them. I get to see that when I'm at a graveside of a loved one as that loved one has stepped into the presence of God. What a privilege it is to serve a risen Savior. And I'm going to tell you right now, according to, to 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus is not alive, everything I'm doing and everything you believe is useless. It is hollow like that bunny, and it's meaningless. Doesn't sound like good news, does it? You want to hear the good news? The good news is this, 1 Corinthians 15, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died, so Christ has been raised from the dead. I'm going to quote Pastor Judah Smith. He says, newsflash, regardless of the state of the world or or the... the polls results of your favorite politician, Jesus is still in control. He wasn't voted in, and he can't be voted out. I love that, right? Judah's dad used to preach, we serve a big, a great big God, and we are opposed by a little little bitty devil. Don't get those turned around, right? Great big God, itty bitty devil, right? So keep that in mind. In Romans 10, again, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you are made right by God, and it's by confessing with your mouth that you're saved. Jesus is alive today. So here's the response. For those of you that earlier enthusiastically said, yes, I believe that, If you claim to be a Christian today and believe in a risen Savior, then live like it. 
If you claim that you're a follower of Jesus, if someone walked up to you and said, are you a believer in Jesus Christ, and you said yes, then you better live like it, right? Because if you're not living it, it may not be true. I'm not really here to help you question your salvation. I'm just saying if you're not, if if there's no change, there's no Jesus, okay? So you live like it. Jesus is alive, so look alive, right? Right? Colossians 3 says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Always live in view of eternity alive. Always live in view of eternity. I said this earlier today. I like the statement that says, Live as if Jesus was crucified yesterday, rose again today, and is coming back tomorrow. Those who claim to be Christians today Let's live like it. Let's act like it. Let's talk like it. Let's preach like it. Let's work like it. Let's worship like it, right? Those of you who are here that are maybe a little bit skeptical about all of this and you're just kind of checking it out, I want to encourage you to keep seeking the truth. Keep asking questions. Look at the evidence and the proof. We're starting a new series next week. I'm going to do a series in the, from the New Testament where Jesus, we're, who is Jesus, and the great I am statements of Jesus in the, in the New Testament. So you can check that out. God's not intimidated by your questions. But remember this. When the student's ready, the teacher will appear. So when you're ready, if you seek me, you will find me. That's what God said. Those of you who are ready to take the step of faith, place your faith and trust in Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life. You don't need more proof. You got it. You just need to walk up here and say, I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. Peter Larson said, despite our efforts to keep him out, God intrudes. The life of Jesus is bracketed by two impossibilities, a virgin's womb and an empty tomb. Jesus entered our world through a door marked no entrance and left through a door marked no exit. I love the story that Billy Graham tells of Dr. Albert Einstein. And Einstein was on, on a train going to Paris, I believe. He got on the train and he sat down and he began to look for his ticket. He saw the guy coming to check the tickets, right? So he's like looking, he's like, oh man, and the guy comes up and and he says, I, I, I can't find my ticket. And the guy says, Dr. Einstein, we all know who you are. We're sure you got a ticket, okay? Don't worry about it. And he's like, okay. So the guy keeps going, and he looks back, and he sees Dr. Einstein on the floor, looking under the seat, under the chair. He's like look, frantically looking, and he goes back. And he says, Dr. Einstein, I told you, we all know who you are. We believe you have a ticket. Don't worry about it. Dr. Einstein looked at him and says, son, I know who I am too. What I don't know is where I'm going. (laughs) You cannot leave here today. You should not leave here today. I pray that you won't leave here today without knowing where you're going to spend eternity. Because the empty tomb says, I've done everything for you to spend eternity with me. So I'm going to have the band come up, and they're going to do a song called Come to the Altar. I'm going to close out with this. This is how we close out our service each week. We have a time of response. And during that time of response, we just have our leaders come up. There's men and women up here, uh, maybe a couple or two, but there's just people up here to pray with you. And if you're here today, and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you'd like to take that step, you're ready for that. God's been pursuing you, knocking on the door of your heart, and you're ready for that step. I want you to come up here and talk to one of these, one of our response team. Maybe you're here today, and you're a believer, but you've slipped away somehow. You've drifted away from that, and it's time to hear God say to you, come home you want to come up, kind of as the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter, and say, Lord, forgive me. I want to recommit my heart to you. Maybe you're here today, and you have a family member or a friend or someone that just really needs prayer right now, and you want to come up and just lift them up in prayer. Whatever you want to do on that, whatever your step is, I'm going to give you time for that. So I'm going to pray, 
Once the music starts, we're going to stand and you can come up for prayer, all right? So let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessing in our lives. God, we thank you for just the, the love of God that is aimed right at our heart that goes right to the depth of our soul that says, I love you, and I want you in eternity with me forever. And God, I pray for each one in this room today that we would leave not hoping that we're on our way to heaven, but knowing where we're going, where we're going to spend eternity, and living like that right now, followers of Jesus. Pray for each one here today who needs to make a decision. God, they wouldn't wait. They come up, talk to someone, pray with someone. We give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand. If you're going to help with the response team, come on up. Guys,